Welcome to another special edition episode of Last Week in Quantum. This is the show where we review the top news in the world of quantum and its impacts on the world of cybersecurity, AI, and more. I'm your host, Rebecca Krothmer, and today we have an expert in the fields of quantum and emerging tech, Anastasia Martinkova. And I'm actually going to turn it over to her to give her background because it is incredible and diverse. But I will say you may recognize her face if you are even interested in the world of quantum, you've probably seen her videos. They're the ones that pop up at the top when you put when you put quantum into your YouTube search bar. So it is my great pleasure to turn it over to Anastasia to introduce herself. Thank you so much for having me. And yeah, my friends are, I'm sure, sick of my face popping up whenever they Google anything quantum, but here I am again, and hopefully it's going to be useful. But my background is I've been in the quantum space for almost 15 years now. I started out doing neutral atom quantum memories in my undergrad, started a company, went off a little bit into startup land, uh, went back to grad school and trapped ions, then moved into superconducting qubits and was really deep on the hardware, then did a lot of work with algorithms and HPC. So I've been all up and down the stack in the quantum space. And when I was in grad school at University of Maryland, I was in DC. And that's when I really got interested in security because those were the questions that people were asking in the DC area, obviously, with the government that they really were already looking into quantum technology as a threat to current encryption standards. So I started learning more about that, started writing, started creating YouTube videos, and here I am today. Well, it is so great to have you. And uh, the, the theory, uh, one of my favorite theories on genius is not someone who can go all the way down deep into a specific subject, but someone who can look at different areas uh, of an ecosystem and pull the different threads together and see the bigger picture for people. So thank you for being a quantum genius. Oh, thanks so much. <laughs> I wouldn't call myself a genius, but I have a lot of curiosity and I hope that that shows in the work that we've been doing. And I think it's really important for the future of technology in general. These technologies don't exist in a vacuum. And as the paradigm shifts, right, we're going to need a lot of people with a lot of different backgrounds to use quantum computers, to support quantum computing, and actually have it be useful for every day and change the world. 100%. And speaking of bringing different topics together, today, we're going to talk about news in the world of blockchain when it comes to the quantum threat. And so this article is um, is diving into the the potential impact that uh, that quantum decryption will have on the blockchain. And I think this is this is a really important one because uh, it's uh, it's it's an impact that people might not often think about, but obviously has huge repercussions. Um, because blockchain is is every year used more and more. And so I think how we want to take this conversation today, Anastasia, is let's talk about the different personas and how they should be thinking about the risk, the threat to blockchain. So uh, I'd like to first start with how, if you're an executive of an organization that um, that utilizes blockchain or cryptocurrency, how should you be thinking about this landscape? Yeah, definitely. So there's a lot to think about in terms of, first of all, comparing it to traditional databases and things like that. So blockchain is very different from the databases that we have today. And while we talk a lot about the quantum security, uh, quantum is a threat to banking, to all our logins, to everything that we do, right? sometimes you can look at it and see that the path to upgrade might be a little bit easier there. So there, what we're seeing is that, so for example, you have a bank, right? And you say it's encrypted by a quantum algorithm. Your password is encrypted that way. A quantum computer comes out tomorrow. Let's say we already have a post-quantum encryption algorithm that's out there that we know works and you're kind of ready to deploy that you kind of can just reset everyone's passwords and say like, you know what, all your passwords are invalid right now. You have to go create a new password and now it's going to be encrypted with a new algorithm. So yes, that's a lot of work to do on the architecture side at the beginning, but it's pretty quick to switch over to a new paradigm if we have everything else in place, right? Blockchain is much more difficult and this conversation is still ongoing. And even from 
when I started really digging into the space in 2014, so I was into cryptocurrency very early on, there were already questions arising about how do we actually do these upgrades, right? And the, the process is going to be completely different. So number one is figuring out where the gaps are, right? So the same thing as you'd be doing with your classical systems, you have to figure out where the gaps are. Big one is in transactions. So the public key is exposed when you do a transaction. So if you reuse the key, that is exposed and a hacker could take that, right? But there's even deeper aspects of it. So that key is exposed at the beginning of the transaction. Could someone even come in faster with a quantum computer, get the private key and decrypt it in the transaction time? Usually transaction times are short, but you know, you see that what if there's this future again, a quantum computer comes out tomorrow and everyone panics, right? Everyone wants to get their Bitcoin out. We have had in past history transaction times of think up to 10 plus days, like double digit days of transaction times. We've seen papers that say, you know, we could maybe decrypt a key in eight hours. Then there's the whole additional layers of Satoshi's keys are completely different from the beginning. So the question is, how do we even upgrade, right? And I think that's a question that if you are a blockchain executive, you really need to start thinking about how you're going to do this and how much you're relying on the community as well. So for example, Bitcoin community is very, very split on quantum. They're saying, you know, once we see keys being stolen, then we might start looking at it. That seems problematic if you want to use like you don't want someone to say like, oh, once we rob a bank, then we're going to upgrade the security. Right. That's not a good thing. Um, but what do we do then? So we create a fork. Right. OK. But then what happens to the old coins? Is there a time that a transition time that we have? And that might take a lot longer than it would to transition. Again, we can just reset everyone's passwords on a bank. So there's a lot to think about here. And I think what really an executive needs to think about in the space is, first of all, understand where your vul vulnerabilities are in your architecture and what that uh, upgrade path looks like and how long that takes and start creating those roadmaps. Because without that, you just you're it's going to take a lot of time. And obviously we are going through the NIST PQC competition right now. So there are going to be recommended algorithms that people can upgrade to, but also there's going to be multiple ones. So internally you have to figure out which one you're going to go to. There's different solutions there, but I'll stop there right now because uh, it's, a, it's a lot and it's a big paradigm shift, I think, for companies either in the legacy system or in the blockchain to really have to sit down and think about and understand quantum to be able to create a roadmap. Yeah. And I, so much good content there. And I think you, you did a really good job of laying out the, the, the landscape for people. And if you could make it really simple, um, what, what should they be worrying about in terms of the store now decrypt later or harvest now decrypt later threat over here? And then the, uh oh, it happened. Somebody, some, some actor now has that cryptographically relevant quantum computer. So what's what are the use cases here? And then what are the use cases here? And obviously these ones, the, the store now to crypt later, act now. And um, since we don't know when what some people are calling Q day will happen, uh, what are these use cases over here? Right. So for the harvest now to crypt later attacks, the issue is you need the people are targeting data here that is going to be relevant for a decade plus. So you're really looking at industries here in security applications, right? So that's why the government has been looking at this for a decade, because they're saying, you know, there's it's like agents involved, right? Their, their personal information, this sort of thing. That's something that's going to be relevant. Old projects, right, that haven't been released, like this sort of stuff that is still going to be relevant in 10 years. That's what people are targeting right now, Harvest Now, Decrypt Later. For the quicker transitions, again, if there's something that can be invalidated pretty quickly, like a password reset, that's something that you can, I wouldn't say wait for that, right? But maybe, and, and I think this is just something you do with basic security, right? You're like, what is the tier one data? What is the tier two? What is tier three, right? People's emails are out there. If you, if you have like the email stored with a non-quantum encryption, Maybe that's not the worst thing ever because everyone's emails are out there. However, it depends on the website that you have, right? Um, you don't want to say like they're a user of the website, but if you know my website is out on my uh, page right now, anyone can email me. So I don't mind that being really released anywhere. 
So those are the things you have to think about. It's like, how quickly can I invalidate uh, that data? And how quickly can I upgrade on that end? And then think about that data, that tier one data that can have long-term national security, banking applications, these sort of things, um, even IP. That's that's pretty important to already start looking at uh, in this PQC space. And the... I think, you know, one of the things I like to talk about most is there's there's so much sort of, I think, confusion just by nature of quantum being a cool and somewhat intimidating word in and of itself. Um, and so quantum threat sounds even more intense, right? Um, but as you were saying, when you, when you were talking to the execs, um, whatever your path forward does end up being, it's imperative to be planning and assessing. And really the simple fact is that that you probably have assets, um, offerings, whatever it may be, that uh, that do leverage technology that is vulnerable to quantum attack, whether it's blockchain or um, or other data sharing infrastructures. And so um, to your point, NIST also, NIST has confirmed that they will be announcing the final standards for this round no later than the end of August. So it's a really exciting time, right, to be to be taking this this uh, assessment period very seriously and, and planning for that transition. Um, so, OK, let's let's take it. Let's shift it a little bit. And so we've talked about execs. What about regulators who are thinking about uh, regulation for security of blockchain technology? Yeah, so one of the questions that I've talked to customers about is they say, well, what happens if this algorithm is broken too, right? So the classes of algorithms that are coming out in these new regulations, we are likely going to see multiple classes of algorithms. And as you mentioned, it's going to be round one released, but there's still a second round coming in, right? So the regulators right now are looking at different classes of algorithms because this is still a pretty new research field. And it's a very interesting one because you have to have both the quantum people and the cryptographers working together because those are different types of attacks, right? So that algorithm can be quantum secure, but maybe it's not classically secure, right? And we we have had that happen. One of the uh, semifinalists, I believe, in the NIST competition got broken over a weekend on a regular laptop, right? Even if it was not quantum secure, that's not going to be useful. So those are the two pathways that we need to think about. And then the question is, is how do you transition over time? So what we're seeing right now in the industry is messaging apps, especially speaking of harvest now decrypt later, messages can be very important um, for long term security and, you know, just your personal information. So what they're doing is they're doing hybrid uh, algorithms. And this is something interesting I learned recently. The security community says uh, hybrid uh, terminology is very different than what we call in a quantum space. So I want to clarify that hybrid here means that this is uh, encrypting with both a known algorithm and the new quantum algorithm on top, right? So you're double encrypting, and that has consequences and trade-offs in terms of time performance. However, again, if you're looking at very, very important data, this might be your best path forward right now as we're starting to learn more about these algorithms. And I think regulators are starting to look at like, how do they recommend that and uh, really need to think about that in terms of what's the path forward instead of just releasing the algorithm and saying, go for it, you guys. Uh, it's, it's a very interesting transition time, and that's going to take maybe a decade to, to even do at the time. So there will need to be support on that end as well. Yeah, two, two things I love about what you said. Um, the hybrid, I think you're making a really great point, right? In in the quantum world, it's hybrid would be leveraging uh, quantum computers and classical computers to, to perform uh, an, an assignment together, right? And in the PQC world, post-quantum cryptography world, it's um, classical encryption algorithm plus a post-quantum algorithm. But I think it's a good opportunity to remind people that I think a lot of people still think that you need quantum algorithms or a quantum computer to fight against quantum decryption. And that's just not the case, right? Um, so it is, it, that, that hybrid piece really is different. Um, and second, I think what you're talking about, they're, they're putting forward algorithms based on different like mathematical primitives, right? And so um, it's, a, it's actually a really cool thing because we have been caught flat-footed by 
using essentially one type of math to secure all of our data communications. And um, they're being really deliberate in what they're putting forward and saying, no, not again, we are gonna have these different options. And so if one does fundamentally end up broken, then but by classical or quantum, like you're saying, then we will uh, we'll have these backups. And it's very unlikely that, that, that they'll both get broken at the same time. So it's, I think it's very cool kind of fixing the foundation of, of uh, how we think about encryption. Okay, finally, um, if I am the lay person, maybe I own cryptocurrency or I, um, I partake, I, I use blockchain-based services, what should I be thinking about? Definitely. So I think one of the issues in the field is just the education in general. And, and that's something that you just talked about that I want to point out again. PQC is a very specific term, and maybe we should define that. So post-quantum cryptography are classical algorithms that can stand up against quantum attacks, right? And so understanding that versus quantum cryptography actually uses quantum hardware. And so there's also a little bit of a confusion there in the security field about, well, let's use the quantum computer to encrypt everything. There's th these classical algorithms that we're talking about are really focused. And I, this is how I kind of talk to security people about it, really focused on the uh, asymmetric encryption, public key, versus the quantum cryptography is more, I would liken it to AES algorithms or symmetric cryptography. And so when you kind of understand those aspects, you kind of understand where these different technologies will play in. And so for as someone that owns cryptocurrency assets, it's first of all, looking at the roadmaps, looking at what they're, what they're doing and what their plans are, which is still very early stage, right? But are people even talking about this in conversation? What are their upgrade plans? Are they talking to people in the field, because again, this is such a new, interesting field where you need both the quantum and the cryptographer side to come together to find a solution. Now, there's things that you can do also on your end. So there's uh, new wallets that you can get that it can actually uh, post-quantum encrypt at least your wallet, right? Uh, some of them use Lamport signatures and the idea is even if it's stolen, even if your blockchain doesn't upgrade, right? Um, you can still prove that you owned it through this Lamport signature. So that's something to look into and uh, really just be aware of what the next steps are. And, and there's companies coming out with post-quantum blockchains that are already built in. So as someone that, you know, and you should probably do this for most things uh, that you visit is understanding kind of the security there and understanding the consequences of if this doesn't upgrade, like what's going to be your tipping point for moving away from that cryptocurrency. Um, it's a long process and we'll hear a lot about it from the cryptocurrency side, but people should be educated on this and keep an eye out. That is helpful. I think about whenever I, so I, you know, I'm a, I have a diversified portfolio. I have some crypto. I think about it every time I, um, I log in, make a transaction. And, um, you know, I, I don't think it's limited to blockchain, as you said, right? Messaging. I've, every time I send a text message to a friend, or a private communication, be email or anything it is. I think about that idea that um, <clears throat> Harvest Now Decrypt Leader is is an active thing that's that's already happening. So we should be thinking about how, how our data is secure. And as a consumer, right, as you were just saying, making choices um, that that support uh, support secure decision making, <laughs> and and also putting pressure on on organizations to be taking this very seriously. All right. Thank you so much, Anastasia, for joining. Uh, it's such a pleasure to be able to talk to you. Um, thank you for everything you do to explain this ecosystem in a way that makes it very accessible. And uh, and you heard it here. Anastasia's email is available on her website. So if you have any quantum questions or need to start thinking about some of the implications of quantum for your organization, do give her an email and do come to our webinar next month. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. If you liked today's episode and are interested in learning more about protecting the blockchain from quantum threats, join us August 14th for our webinar, where we'll be joined by the awesome Larry Wade, who is PayPal's senior director, serving as the risk, legal, and customer operations business partner for PayPal's blockchain, crypto, and digital currencies. You can find the link to register in the description below.